Welcome to the lab. I'm Science Rob, and on this show, we're answering your carbon capture and sequestration questions with fun science experiments. Today's question comes from Carmen from Maryland, and she asks, can you elaborate on the rock brine CO2 interaction that you mentioned in the first episode? Thank you, Carmen, that's a great question. When we talk about carbon sequestration, we're talking about injecting carbon dioxide or CO2 deep underground into the reservoir that was carefully selected. For more information on which rock properties make an ideal CO2 injection reservoir, see episode one. We're generally looking for reservoirs that are full of brine or salt water because we don't want CO2 getting into reservoirs that are potential sources of fresh drinking water. Now you may be asking, why would there be water in the rock in the first place? The answer is simple, gravity. That far underground, the pore spaces of the rock are not just empty like this, but they're saturated with water. And because of minerals that are naturally occurring down there, that water is often salty, otherwise known as brine. I have some fun demonstrations to show you how CO2 is stored in water and an example of the possible interaction between water, CO2, and the minerals found in the rock or matrix. You're all probably familiar with carbonated beverages. When we inject a significant amount of CO2 into water, some will exist as bubbles like you see here, or what we call free phase CO2 in the subsurface. These bubbles compete with the brine for space in the pores of the reservoir, and they're buoyant due to their density being lighter than that of brine. But there's also a part that you can't see, a part of the CO2 that dissolves into the water and remains there invisible. This is because CO2 is actually soluble in water. Once we do this, it causes the water to become slightly acidic as it forms carbonic acid. Here are the technical details on how this occurs. To demonstrate how carbonic acid can actually dissolve solid minerals, we'll add sodium bicarbonate or baking soda to our carbonated water. There. Now that things have settled down, you can see we have a completely clear solution. The sodium bicarbonate has been completely dissolved into the solution of carbonic acid. Things can get really interesting when the water is salty, as commonly occurs in the reservoir. Here's a solution of calcium chloride, to which we'll add our dissolved solution of baking soda and carbonic acid. Notice that both solutions are completely clear. When we combine the two clear solutions, we get this reaction. You can see it turning a milky white, which is the formation of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is not very soluble in water, so it precipitates out of solution, which can cause scale. The formation of calcium carbonate precipitate has both positive and negative aspects. The good news is that some of the carbon and oxygen is now bound in a solid mineral, which means it's no longer buoyant, and we don't have to worry about it escaping the reservoir. The bad news is that if precipitation occurs too fast or too close to the injection well, the precipitate may plug up the pores and impair injectivity. This is just like hard water scale plugging up the filter of your kitchen faucet. So now we've seen one interaction by which CO2 can be stored as a mineral. But what about the CO2 that remains dissolved in the water? How much CO2 do you think water can hold? Now let's see this in action. Now that's a lot of CO2. Let's take a moment to consider what reactions like this could mean to a real CO2 sequestration project. To begin to understand this, we need to get real samples of the reservoir rock 
reservoir brine, and the CO2 to be injected. And we analyze all of these in our lab. Once the composition of rock, brine, and CO2 streams have been quantified, we perform a series of experiments to determine which interactions are critical and must be rigorously quantified and accounted for in our reservoir simulation. The principal categories of reactions that we may encounter are dissolution of CO2 into the brine, dissolution of water into free CO2, dissolution of minerals by carbonic acid, and precipitation of solids. We can recreate and quantify all of these interactions in the lab. This takes special equipment and a good deal of time. We perform measurements and re-perform the same measurements again after the rock has been exposed to CO2. There are practical limits to what we can do in the lab. We can test selected key samples to see what will happen in six months, but what about 50 years in the future? What would happen if we tested slightly different samples? That's where digital rock analysis comes in. We put a small sample of rock into a micro CT scanner to create a 3D model of the pores and grains, in which we can simulate the flow of different fluids. That's common in the industry today. Where our simulation is really different and special is in the ability to populate the precise chemical composition of the grains, the brine, and the impure CO2 stream that will be injected. We simulate the injection of CO2 into brine-filled pores, while at the same time evaluating and quantifying any chemical reactions that may occur. We can quickly run hundreds of slightly different simulations over time scales of hundreds or even thousands of years to help operators de-risk the eventual impact of the complex interactions taking place in the rock brine CO2 system. Thanks for watching this episode of Science Rob. I hope to have sparked your curiosity and eagerness to learn more about carbon sequestration. Stay tuned for more, where I'll answer your questions with a fun science experiment. See you in the next one.